Talk 3D, episode two. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming out today. Um, you know, I was thinking about you guys uh, just a couple days ago because I knew we were going to be talking. And um, I was really uh, pleased when I was thinking, wow, we've got some really distinguished people here and people who've done some really great stuff. So we have Mark Newman, who you've won a gold award in Spectrum. <laughs> And I hear actually also a silver and maybe have been nominated also. Um, and Colin, you've won a silver award in Spectrum and been nominated numerous times as well as in IBA. And Randy, you've done quite a few um, things that we all wish we got to do more of, which are huge park-sized monuments. That's like the sculptor's dream. It's what we all want to do. So if we get a chance, we'd love to talk to you a bit more about that. But um, the longer time I spend uh, introducing you, the less time that everybody gets to spend hearing from you guys, and you're all terrific, fabulous, and talented. So um, the first thing that I'd like to have you talk about is, um, why don't, Mark, why don't you start? Uh, what have you been doing lately? What are you working on? Well, I've, most of the work I do is all commercial work. Um, so I've been working on uh, just a bunch of stuff. I, I work a lot for the collectibles industry and do stuff for different companies. But since the pandemic thing, it's those companies slow down a lot. So I've been doing my own stuff. And it's sadly, well, sadly in one respect that I, it's a lot of digital work, which I, I've got to do that, had to learn it commercially. So I've been doing a lot of that stuff just designing and creating my own characters. I do a lot for the garage kit area where people buy something and want to put it together and paint it themselves. I'm like getting back into that. So I just be creating a lot of kooky wild characters. And I mean, I, I can't go a day without doing something creative. So I'll just come up here and tinker around with stuff and maybe it sits there, maybe it doesn't. So little projects here and there professionally for a, a um, pinball game company for elements within the game and on toppers and stuff. So. It's kind of all over the place, really. So when when you're um, working within, uh, Z, you use ZBrush. Yes. How do how do the things end up becoming three D? Then they um, you they three D print them, which is all the technology has grown so huge where it can be super detailed, and they can get any you know you can print them at any size. There's a lot of ways to work with it, but it's three D printed, and then it's molded and cast and produced that way. And before it was all, you know, it's, it's, it used to be all hand sculpted, but for the collectibles industry and stuff, it's now it's all turned mostly digital. So, but then the casting and produce production level or, uh, you know, thing is all kind of the same. It's like, then you got to rubber mold and cast it and make them. So um, the actual sculptors had to learn to transfer into digital if you wanted to still do that kind of work, you know, and, get paid it pays pretty well so it's good to do so what's your preference or do you have a preference um people ask a lot and it's there's a preference i don't know i mean i like digital because you can go fast and you can change and do iterations and keep old files and bring in stuff and you know kit bash basically but you don't get that tactile satisfaction with clay and it's that's what I love about the, the actual clay, but to do it as a collectible to sell, I mean, not, I, I can't seem going back into clay, which I used a polymer clay called Super Sculpey where you bake in your oven. And I can't see going back that way to do it for collectibles because it's changes and edits and, and you have to cut it up and set it up for molding and casting. But for my fine art stuff and I mean clay, I, I prefer that. So it's, depending what project really is what I prefer. So was something like your eel walker, was that done in Super Sculpey or was that? No, that, well that was, no, that for my own fine art, I like, um, I like oil-based clay. That was a Chavant, uh, you know, the NSP. And that's, I love that. So that's, that's what Randy uses all the time. And it, you know, you don't have to wrap it in plastic because it's not water-based. So it can sit on your shelf and harden up over seven or eight years like a lot of my stuff does even before I mold it. So I prefer oil-based clay when I work in the fine art area. I saw, I saw the Eel Walker piece in person at his studio before he even molded it. I saw it in clay and I knew it was going to be something else. So yeah, I got to see, I had the privilege of seeing that guy in person for that girl. 
we're, we're jealous of that. And I was, I was saying, um, because Randy said that he's, he's got some of your work. And I said, well, if it's the eel walker, I'm breaking into your house. And he's like, I want it. <laughs> You didn't want to pay what I was asking for it. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so just to, do you th do you feel that there's there still could be work in that industry for a, a traditional sculptor, or do you have to be digital in order to to succeed in that industry? Um, no, you could still do it, uh, but the companies usually prefer that digital because they have the variation. Of, well, I want to print this. I want to make it now at six scale. And it's not about sculpting a new one to match that. It's just about sizing it in the printer. And then, uh, and it's so easy for them. Actually, the more digital work you get, the more they art direct because it's easier to change something and tweak something. And they know that now. So it's a uh, art director's dream, but a, a sculptor's nightmare kind of thing. <laughs> mm. um, and yeah, so the versatility of digital for commercial work to mass produce and sell and then move on to the next thing is, I don't see it going back to traditional very, very easily. Yeah. This is a big meteor that hits the road. <laughs> Both of you guys are using the Chavant products. So NSP versus Le Beau Touche. What are your thoughts? Randy, you go. Actually, I'm using the JMAC soft. I ended up just getting the tan soft JMAC years ago for that some huge projects and that's, I just keep remelting and reusing it. So it, mine's just a, a lesser clay that it works pretty much the same, but it's the J-Mac. We've used that on our monumental work. It's, it's, it's very smooth and when you're working on large masses, um, it's very workable. Is that what you guys used for that last installation that you ran down in uh, Loveland, at the foundry in Loveland? Yeah, yeah, the guy with the books, he was, we did with J-Mac. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, and um, Gary De Chateau in Loveland did the enlarging uh, the photo oh, okay. for us. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Randy, since you're since you're on the spotlight, why don't you tell us what you've been up to, what you've been making? Um, I've just been actually playing around with my own stuff. It's just been really nice. This uh, pandemic just kind of gave me a chance just to kind of do what I wanted to do that I've been wanting to do just for myself. So. I've always been wanting to do an angler fish, so this is that guy without the teeth. Um, the teeth are here, but can you show it the teeth more... closer to the camera? Can you put the sure? What are those teeth made? I love your studio, Randy. It's really nice and neat and set up. Yeah, it's almost like I am in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. There's my angler fish, and here's the teeth that will go in. I don't know if you can see that. Are the teeth in sculpy or something? Or these I actually did in epoxy sculpt. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I I'm plucked them all out, and I have all the little holes. Can you see that in the light? Yeah. Okay, but I got I'm kind of re-sculpting and putting the, uh, you know, the gums in there and stuff, and then I'll just, when I do end up casting this in resin then I'll just glue the teeth in last after I've done coloring. Oh, each, each one, instead of doing a, like a gum rut, a gum and then a bunch of teeth and cast that as one piece? You never done that? Or? Uh, I was thinking about that, but I don't know how good I would be at molding them. And yeah, while, awesome. this, while this seems tedious, it's kind of more just, I can put my brain in neutral and just kind of glue each one. It's it's just going to be a matter of just super gluing into each each hole. Yeah, so. I'm always thinking production, like if you make 10 of 20 of those, you're going to do that right. all the time, but yeah, so I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I, mean, I, I hope I have that problem, so. <laughs> he's, he's Is that one solid? Uh, yeah, pretty much. There's a maybe a little bit of uh, foam armature inside, just to, I, I put a little piece of pink, pink insulation foam uh, down the middle and then I just melted the J-Mac around that and a coil of armature wire and once it was solidified then I just started packing the clay on and so it's it's pretty darn strong yeah. stronger than I thought it would be so I love your fish we have we have two of his wall hanging fish that are kind of flat uh, plaques that that just sit on the wall. We have two of those pieces and that he did it quite a few years ago in there. Speaking of mutual admiration society, look it over there. There's oh, a picture that Susan did. Oh, my wife's painting and my sculpture. Yep. Cool. <laughs> and then you got your devil dude. I'm going to bring you up closer. Can you see that? 
There's the devil, dude. And, and that, was, that was what I called him, so it's not just a <laughs> Yes. So official title. But yeah, see, his wife, Susan, it's like a talent vortex, just like your house. It's uh, pretty amazing talent over there. And that's, the that's your old dog, Bailey, and Rufus, right? Your dog. Yes. Yeah. New, uh, Susan does incredible pet portraits. It's unbelievable. What's this little vulture fellow in the background there? Yeah, I like it. Oh yeah, that's actually one of my favorite. I mean, I don't, not in a bragging way, but as far as personal favorites, that's probably one of my favorites. That's, me too. I think that's one of my favorites of yours. Just, hey. just, just the the forms and the attitude and the design of it. It's really nice. Give man boobs. <laughs> <laughs> and was was the final cast in resin, or do you do bronzes as well? This, yeah, this has actually only been cast in resin. That's what this one is. It's just a nice resin cast. So. Okay. A company actually out of Albuquerque cast three of them, I think. So, and that was all that ever got cast. And they, the business, I think, kind of went under. A one mold making or something like that out in Albuquerque. So, where do you uh, your stuff cast now? Uh, if there's a couple guys that do it down in Loveland, actually not far from where you were uh, casting your your last monument. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you know Brian Dreither Custom Castings? Yeah. or uh, Sculpture Depot. Yes. Yeah, it's her son that does a lot of really nice resin casting. So Interesting. He'll, he'll do some of my kind of medium to bigger size stuff. And then I just do my own resin casting. So like this is a resin cast that I did all myself. So but that's like a, a maquette of the, that monument you saw a picture yeah. of. The little girl sitting on it or, or there was a photograph. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Do you make your own molds too? Yes. Yeah. If if I have the time and it, if it's in if like if I get a bid on a mold making and it's just I can't get a a reasonable uh, bid, mm -hmm. I just kind of bite the bullet and do it myself. So like the the tree that you saw in the picture that that's I, I sent um, that one I did the mold of. And that about wow, <laughs> yeah, it was huge. Yeah, it was a killer. So, and I also did all the molds for the. And actually, my wife and a good friend of mine helped with that. Mary says hi, by the way, Mark. Um, hey, Mary. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did the the mold for that. Uh, those two guys. It's a like an ostrich, two life size guys, and some other pieces and stuff. So that was all in my studio, which was way too small for doing molding, but it worked. So. When you're making a mold for, for a resin cast piece, do you, do you make it the same way you would for bronze? So it's silicone with a plaster mother mold? Or is it um, for the For the bigger pieces for bronze, if, I, if I'm only gonna be, do, be doing wax casting, then I'll do urethane molds. Um, but for resin casting, I always do silicone molds. Okay, and they have a plaster mother mold on top? Yes. And I actually like to use a, uh, if it's not urethane, but they make a new material. Uh, Tom Keebler turned me on to it, but it's like a foam kind of lighter uh, two-part material. So it's just a lot lighter for a mother mold. So, so um, when you're, we haven't done resin casting, but when you um, do resin casting, you pour the resin in and you roll it around so it's hollow, right? The yeah, point. like like that little snail I just showed you, depending mm -hmm. on the size, a lot of times I'll just do them solid because it just kind of gives a better feel to the piece. Yeah. But like I did a, a bust, like a Dracula, a cartoon Dracula bust, mm -hmm. and that one, and it about killed me, but I've got a big one. That was it's, a big one, right? Almost like yeah, almost it's, mostly yeah. life size. Yeah, it's like 27 inches tall, I think. Yeah, it's pretty much life size. So it's a huge mold but i i was able to kind of slush and roll it around and do a hollow cast of that so so that's not like a special machine you can stick this thing in that rolls it it's just no i do want to get a rotor i would love to get a rotor yeah. yeah. a rotor caster would be awesome but you know room and money right now and you sure. know and brains i'm just too stupid to <laughs> build your art way well, I think so. We all, once we all um, have our ways of doing things, it takes a lot to convince us that it's worth doing it another way. Exactly. You know? I'm impressed by the, the size you guys work. 
Colin and, and Christine, just, you know, the big stuff you're always doing and molding. I mean, that's, that's so sweet. And then you go to the little stuff to make money <laughs> or the quick money. So you guys are marketing yourself really well. Doug, yeah. told us, Doug told us that um, our scale of work is a bit impractical. <laughs> well, for, yeah, for like a Monster Palooza or the, the designer con and stuff. But. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to come back to some of these things. You guys are touching on some really interesting stuff. But um, Colin, what, what have you been doing lately? I mean, last time we saw you're working on this big four foot enlargement of a thing that's going to be cast into bronze, but I don't see that today. So what are you doing now? Uh, it's right there. Um, it's it's just out of the out of view. I'm still I'm still working on that. It's still um, it, still nursing the details on it. Yeah, and, I saw some of that when we chatted. It was it looked really great. So sorry, go on. <laughs> and I've also been playing around with a lot of different patinas. We love the idea of sculptures having their own personalities. And with patinas, I can make each one unique, which is fun for me, and it's I think also fun for the collectors. We've been expanding on the bronze talisman collection and now joining the cormorant pendant, we have the ibis. And also Christine has been making these delightful talisman holders based on hands from some of my sculptures. And I've been having a great deal of fun giving them this variety of personality with the patinas as the talismans have. In addition to traditional torch patinas, I've also been experimenting with fume patinas, which bring out these incredible blues and teals. When you're fuming them, um, how we had first seen it done, the guy had sawdust or newspaper and he'd soak it with ammonia and leave the piece buried in there and it'd leave all these textural marks on there. Oh. But you started doing something different, right, Colin? Because it really scared I, me the other day when I opened this bowl and I was like, oh my God, what's in there? <laughs> But yeah, you're doing something different, right? That makes it a little more consistent, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I'm, try I'm trying to suspend it so that nothing actually touches it when it's being fumed so you don't have spots of inconsistencies. And, um, and then I have so some moist, uh, dry moss that is soaked with the uh, whatever I'm using to foam. Oh, cool. <laughs> Any anything to scare you when you open a little container and go, ah. And uh, those, those adult skulls, those are unicorns? Yes, the unicorns are new as well, and they all have unique horns. I love that aspect. It's not the same old, you know, ringed horn, and, and everyone has their own growth pattern. That's such a cool concept. Yeah. It, we started out, or I started when I was doing them, I, I kept doing one and going, oh, I really like that, but I'm going to try another one. And then I had a set of uh, 10 of them and asking Christine, of course, you know, what do you think? Which one? And yeah, we ended up with all of them. All of them. Yeah, that's such a, I love that. I think because we do a lot of the bronze process ourselves. So we do the wax chasing and we do the <laughs> bronze chasing. It's even worse if like you have an edition, either an open edition or a big edition and everyone is the same. <laughs> It just like drives you bonkers. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's a certain- These guys weld and chase too? Yeah, uh, you, do. Yeah. you do welding and chasing. I don't, I don't weld, but Colin welds. Um, wow. we're chasing. Um, we joke that um, we're usually arm wrestling, and whoever loses has to do the bronze chasing because it's such a horrible job. <laughs> yeah. do, you get, do you guys get carpal tunnel syndrome at all, or do you guys got some pretty smooth tools? Or? Um, I think we vary what we do enough, and anything I can do with my left hand, I do, um, including, you know, things around the house. Um, I try to preserve the right hand as much as possible, but I think because we, we vary from, you know, working tiny and working big and doing chasing and doing, you know, all these different tasks. Um, my hope is that it um, keeps those things from getting damaged, you know, from doing that repetitive movement all the time. But I do notice we have Fordhams, um, so that's like a, a Dremel on steroids. And um, they're much nicer than a Dremel. But I do notice if I've spent many hours uh, chasing, your hand gets a little numb and feels a little funny. So um, we try not to do that if we can. Um, so that's an interesting little thing. Left hand and right hand. What, what, what's your dominant hand, everybody? Right. 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 I'm a lefty. No way. <laughs> so oh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, so um, 
Rich, can you tell us um, a little bit, and actually Colin too, because you've done the monumental work, and Mark, you've said you've done some life-size portraiture. Um, uh, so a couple of things. How do you, um, if you've done more than one monumental size thing that was a public artwork, um, how do you go about uh, acquiring those kinds of commissions? That's something that people ask us all the time. Obviously, we all apply. I'd like to know that too. <laughs> yeah, but actually getting through the application process to where you're the one that they pick is um, seems to be a mixture of talent and right place, right time, and a real great fit. So um, if you have any tips for that, we want to know. <laughs> I Do you want to go, Colin, or you want me to? You. I'm, I'm going to be all ears. I'm just going to repeat whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just was doing, my wife and I have been doing uh, fine art shows all over the United States. Uh, shortly after I left, I used to work at the Foundry and I did patinas there for six and a half years. And so after I quit there, I had built up a inventory of bronzes and stuff. And my wife and I would apply to these different shows all over the United States and just whichever good ones we could get into one, whichever ones had a good rating. Um, I know like art fair source book is a good way to figure out if a, if a show is a money maker or whatever. Um, but we just tried to get into the really good ones like the Sausalito art festival, uh, coconut grove art festival. Um, even the Loveland sculpture show, which is just 20 miles from here. Um, has always done really well for me, but that's where I have pretty much got all my commissions. Just uh, a lot of times people that are representing like certain cities will be walking through the shows and just looking for people they know that would fit whatever they're looking for as far as public placement. So I know you can go on to like cafe management. I don't know if you've seen that site, but there's a, there's a uh, online, Thing where you can just apply to different cities for their for their call for artists and stuff. They usually have bud budgets for. I think I saw one out in, in L.A. for your area, Mark, um, or the San Francisco area. Some there was some park that was looking for, you know, life size sculpture or something like that. So, but they list stuff like that all the time in cafe management. So. Wow. When when you're at a show and somebody walks by and likes something, um, do they invite you to apply for a particular call or do they just say, I love that thing, I'm going to buy it for the city and then they just do that? Because I was under the impression that for public artworks, they have to do some kind of open call. So um, is that a particular niche? Um, it just depends, you know? I mean, I I think some a lot of times they'll, they do they do that call for artists. They kind of have to go through the legal thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, like I've been fortunate enough to have somebody, one of my best clients uh, was, uh, her name is Joyce Doty. She's, she walked through the show. She was uh, Charles Schultz's first, uh, the peanuts creator, mm -hmm. uh, her, his first wife. He, she's got 250 acres of a bot botanical slash sculpture garden on Kauai, just beautiful place. She came in and she said, I want, this, 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 you know? So, and it started from there. That's where I started getting major commissions. So sometimes it's just, that's just how it is. It just kind of, for me, it, and it just fell in my lap. I was very, very fortunate. So, um, but as far as cities coming in, I've, I even had somebody from Redding, California that said, you know, we're gonna, we're supposed to do a call for artists, but I want this piece. So, wow. you know, they don't, I don't think they, technically really have to um they may they might do it to see if they can find something better you know yeah but you know if it, if it saves them time of going through all these applications they'll just say i want what you got so are those uh monumental outdoor works are those resin cast i know all of them are bronze that i've done in pretty outdoor pieces the resin just wouldn't hold up over time so what about fiberglass? Would that hold up? That probably would. It's just, it's just not gonna wear like bronze would, you know. It'll, it'll kind of fade, and you know, you're, you're gonna have to repaint it, and that's what it is. You have to do with fiberglass usually too. You have to paint it as, as opposed to 
like what Colin's doing. It's just a nice chemical patina, you know. So, so are uh, you doing the patinas on your larger pieces? You said you've been yeah. doing patinas for a while. Yeah, it's the only it's the only part of the process that I can't let go of. I'm really anal retentive about coloring my stuff. So um, the piece, actually, the the last big commission I did that went to Kauai, I did let them color the ostrich and I think the two guys, the two life size guys. Mm -hmm. And it's you know, Nate, if you're listening, when you see this. <laughs> I didn't like how it turned out, so I'm at, they're actually flying me back to re recolor it how I want it. So that's the first time you're telling Nate. <gasps> yes, <laughs> yes. Yikes! So you guys know Nate, right, Colin and and Christine? <laughs> oh, did you meet? Did you meet Nate when you were at our, our castings? Uh, I think we did actually. Uh, okay. We met a lot of people. We went and hung out. Uh, both in the wax phase and also the um, bronze chasing and patina. Okay. And, uh, probably bugged them more <laughs> than what they had hoped for. But um, yeah, they were really great. We love art castings. They're terrific. Colin, with the, the monumental size uh, sculpture that we did, do you, do you prefer the, and Mark, actually, you could answer this too, since you do smaller scale and also life size stuff, do you have a preference in scale? Like, what do you enjoy more? Or I think both, both are exciting, both are fun. It's, uh, it's enjoyable to get your hands on something that's this scale and being able to really dive into it. And it's, it's easy to move, it's easy to, uh, to make major adjustments. You, you, you want it a little more con contraposto, you boom, and you're done. Um, and that can be uh, very gratifying. Then when you get down to the tiny details of the, uh, the insides of the ears, it becomes more of a challenge because mm -hmm. you know big hands, little piece, um, and on the, the and the reverse with the monumental work, you get to really nurse the tiny details. If it was a tiny scale, but if your foot is this big, then you can really get into all of the the curvatures and the lines and and the top topography of it, and that's exciting. But it's a little more challenging to make. Uh, major shifts. So if you want to um, do something that was unplanned, uh, it's a, a bit more of a beast. Have you ever done work where as a monumental, you do the maquette, whatever size, you know, manageable size, I keep throwing away, um, and then it's scanned and um, either milled in, in you know, the the foam, dense foam, and then you have to just clay over and fi finalize it? Or do you build yours uh, that size, working off your own maquette, or just start that size? I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And You want to jump in, Christine? You haven't had that sure. answer any questions. You could see me nodding my head and going, no. I know. Oh, yeah. No, um, for the, the Zemp project, which was the monument we did in 2018, um, we did a maquette that was, I think, one third life size um, out of the Le Touche, and that was what the committee approved. And then we had Gary Duchateau, he digitally scanned it and milled it in uh, the blue foam to, I believe, was it a quarter inch? I think it's a quarter inch shy of what it should be so that uh, it's room for you to put the clay on. And we used the JMAC, we melted it and just brushed it on. We had to do a couple of coats. And Colin did a lot of adjusting on the foam before we actually did the clay because, you know, very things like ears and stuff, they don't translate and they get milled too thin and so they don't show up. And little details on the guy's sweater didn't show what, up. What size them. was the final? Sorry. I uh, hear like seven feet tall. Okay. Yeah, so it was like. 15% bigger than life size. We didn't want him to seem diminutive. And you know, you knew the like eye level that was going to be presented at because that, that whole theory of you're sculpting a maquette and if you blow it up huge, if you don't make like the statue of David, the head bigger than the body, the bottom, it's not going to work in that perspective. I know it wasn't that size, but no, it's you have to keep that into account. No. Yeah, um, what's interesting is that um, there was a company um, on the West Coast. I won't say any more than that. That was really strongly pushing us to do this straight to shell thing where they digitally scan it and they print it in a material that can be burned out that's like extremely toxic. So when foundries do that, they clear out everybody and they don't do it when anybody's around. Yeah. <laughs> was, it, was it California? 
Uh, no, it was, I think, in That's not the one I use that. We'll, we'll yeah. go with West Coast. <laughs> yeah. um, but what we found out was that exactly what you're saying. What looks good to your eye on a smaller scale when you're larger, you're like, oh my God, his head is a basketball. <laughs> and so if we didn't have the foam, because we made a lot of adjustments. Oh, you had, okay, yeah. And we could make the adjustments before it was cast and then we got to re-sculpt it and put our own texture. And we also found, um, because we were told that the, you know, digital printing uh, captured all the tool marks and stuff, but they would print it, dip it in paraffin, and all of the texture and tool marks was gone. And so then the metal guys had to go back in and be chasing in stuff that looked like sculpturing uh, marks. So for our taste, your better bet is to have it enlarged and um, Duchateau has a new machine. Yeah. It's really amazing. It just captures wow. the detail. Um, and then brush your clay on and re-sculpt it. You know, I think you get a better result in the end, but also I think um, there's that tactile experience of sculpting something big. So uh, yeah. I wouldn't think as a sculptor you'd want to miss out on that experience, actually. Christine, yeah, I think the is, last thing you said was very, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I, did De Chateau do the uh, CMC, the milling? Is that how the, the enlarging worked? Yeah. Zem did the milling, the thing on the long arm with the milling. But he just got this new uh, machine. I, I don't actually know what it's called. And it, um, it has a big bed with this big chunk of foam. We went and saw it, and it's just cutting out pieces. Yeah, and can see. Yeah. Like, oh, OK. Yeah, and it, it, so the wind and the waves that Colin's working on right now was done on that new machine, and it really captured much more detail than what he was able to do with the traditional milling machine. Wow. I think with all of that, you still have to adjust it uh, a fair bit. Um, it, it's very close, but uh, there are still elements that it can't capture. There are areas which you end up digging out repeatedly to get enough depth that you can really work the clay into it efficiently. Uh, so there, there's a bit of slice and dice, but it certainly jumps you forward quite a bit. And something I was going to add to what Christine said at the end was one of the things that we like as you enlarge a piece, when you actually get to re-sculpt it, it's a pleasure. And the reason we're sculptors is we enjoy sculpting. And so the, the shortcut of going large and just straight to shell uh, circumvents what gives us pleasure. Yeah, and it's not your piece anymore. You almost hand it, hand it over to technology and others. And the only the only enlarging I've done was per, was all hand done. It was it was from a maquette, or it was stuff I was commissioned to do for Stanford University in their sport one of their sports buildings where it was it was one third life six scale. So the full figure, the biggest one I've done was one third ish. Little actually, it's probably. No, it was more like one half or even bigger, but a bunch of figures of sports figures, and they were gonna, full figures that hang on a wall, so they had to have a backdrop, and they all, and they came off, they weren't bas relief. But I did maquettes, and they liked the, the, the basic designs, you know, maquettes about that big. And then I just built them up from scratch, you know, my studio, um, just kind of measuring off. And they were loose maquettes, so just working that size was manageable without having to scan and mill some parts. And I did use the lot insulated foam to build the inside and then work on that. But that was a lot of, a lot of fun. Cause then you get your own finishing on it and stuff, and then took those to the foundry. Can I suggest yeah. something, Mark? Mm -hmm. Could yeah. you do life size uh, eel walker? You know what? Yeah. That'd be awesome. Wouldn't that be interesting <laughs> enough, which I don't know when, it, if it'll happen, but um, what's his name from uh, Weta Workshop, Richard Taylor, Sir Richard Taylor, you know, um, I met him a few times at Comic-Con and he, I met, I, he knew my work, which blew me away. And, uh, you know, they're the people that did Lord of the Rings, all the special effects and all the, you know, they have the effects house, if, and if you don't know what Weta Workshop is. And they, he was building a sculpture park in New Zealand. That's where they're based. And then that he wanted to house a bunch, just a sculpture park with all this kind of large, I mean, larger than life fantasy kind of art, but really classic. And, and when he met me, he was saying, oh yeah, you've done that, that eel walker piece. And I go, wow, cool, you know it. And um, he goes, when I, when I was thinking of this sculpture park, it was that, I saw that piece and it was like the quintessential, which he used that word, 
uh, kind of uh, theme or, whatever, or piece for this thing, park because it looks classical. It has nice flow to it and it's fantasy, which that's, they're kind of based in that thing. Mm -hmm. And so he says, have you ever thought of doing it life size? I go, well, I need a really good excuse. And so um, he goes, yeah, well, if we get this going, this was many years ago, I think this park's there now, but uh, that would be the only, you know, kind of reason for me to do it because I would be, you know, somebody wants to buy it and put it there. So that would, that would be awesome to do that. It would have to be slightly different design because that whole piece, it's, it's the figure walking and she's on one, originally she was on one ankle and her front toe was just tapping down to the ground. And the, the first one I did was off the ground. So it's just that tension. So that and the eel mounted to her side, it, that was the whole, you know, that was the only little part holding it. So then I have to do some seaweed or something. Yeah, seaweed or something going. But then I touched the foot down because I, I got some that wanted to buy it overseas. I had to ship it. So I ended up just building up that. So there's two little contacts, but anyway, so that would have been a good way to, uh, yeah, if, 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 and then I saw him a couple of years after that, that time he said it and I go, well, I'm still, you know, still want it, you know, <laughs> foundry, I haven't got a quote from the foundry of scanning it and milling it and, you know, either making it and shipping New Zealand or given the scans and they can produce it over there, but it would look cool. Life -size that would be a great bigger. project, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Colin and Mark, and to some degree, Randy, um, you do a lot of uh, traditional type sculpture where you'd be working from a model, but then you have this huge body of work that's imaginative realism or fan fan fantasy art, fantastic art. Um, and Randy, I think most of your work is in solidly in that realm of imaginative realism. Do you have a preference for the traditional or the imaginative realism? Randy, me, what? Colin? <laughs> Mark. Um, I, I go back and forth. I'm, I'm kind of all over the place where in where the mood I'm in, like for a couple months and then something I want to try something different. So it's, it, it depends on, I mean, I, I'll, I love the realistic and subtle forms of the human figure and to, to create that all the time. And, and a lot of the stuff I worked on with the line called Ebony Visions, which was a, um, it was a, six scale kind of hand painted resin line of, of collectibles that came out a long time ago that a friend of mine designed and I sculpted and they're all very realistic and it honed my skills in that sense and it was all paid to do so it was a really good run and then when I got to fantasy stuff it was a lot more fun to exaggerate and get crazy and weird and, and then I go back to the, the subtle female forms like this piece behind me of the woman with the crescent moon behind her. Yeah. I just love that classicness about it and, and, and center on that. But then next month, I'll, I want to make a weird Frankenstein rotting kind of creature character <laughs> or something. So when you're, when you're doing the, the sculptures that you've done quite a few water women, uh, some mermaids and some other creatures combined with water, are you using models for that? And then just combining that with your imagination? Some pieces by, um, yeah, not, not really. The ones I've done, the, some of the mermaid -y stuff, uh, I would gather a lot of reference just online and look at, I would start sculpting and say, wait, what's the shoulder look like in that position? And then I would kind of try to find it. So I never really got a lot of models that way. But um, when uh, we recently hooked up with a bunch of friends, I've done this for a bunch of years now, into a, a, one of those art rooms at Pixar and we hire a model and we do six six evening sessions every Thursday night um, six in a row and then uh, three hours with the model so we just start sculpting the model and then I would take it home <clears throat> I got a whole bunch of these somewhere but uh and then once in a while I would take one I like and refine it into a sculpture so I've done that with this piece over here the moon thing that's going to be something and actually this piece here was a model we had and then I added the snake and wanted her to just be some, so I'll take it further when I get back. Um, but I like fantasy and everything I do in a, in a sense, so that has that sort of element, but not so blatant, you know? And so. Colin, um, do you have a preference for something? I kind of know the answer to this, but you can answer uh, the more traditional or something that's more imaginative realism. And um, what are you doing about models when uh, the quarantine is on? <laughs> I like the crossover. 
I like the ones that are they're imaginative realism, but they have a strong sense of traditional. Uh, and it's the same things that we've seen throughout history, which uh, the hybrids. Uh, so like the, the one that I'm working on with, the, there's also one back here, um, where it's, the, um, it's, it's part of the mythology that I've been writing, but it also, it, 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 it's elements of both, where you have the, the sea creature, which has uh, nods to all those wonderful uh, uh, fountain creatures we've seen in Rome and other places, and yet a very traditional form, but then the ornaments on it bring it back into the imaginative realism. So I think it's, it's sort of the, the hybrid that gets, uh, gets me excited. Um, and as far as models, that's a big challenge right now because models for, for myself and for you are an essential part of it. And uh, each one is a very specific model. It may be uh, adjusted uh, somewhat, but it still stays true to the model that, and for this larger piece, I'll probably have to wait until uh, the COVID situation has abated somewhat before I can finish it so that I can get the model in to do some of the details that are far beyond the details on the smaller version. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question, Colin? Absolutely. Um, when you have a model come in, do you have her just sit and pose and that's where you sculpt from? Or do you have them sit and pose, you take pictures and then you go from the pictures? What are you, what's your preference there? The, in general, what we do is we, we have them come in. Uh, Christine works a little bit differently and I cue them into the story of what I'm doing rather than working with them as a mannequin. It is a, um, it, they're bringing a lot of their own personality to the table and it'll take several sessions to refine a pose to something that I, uh, I think is gonna work well for a particular piece. Then we're photographing them uh, all the way around, uh, all the details and blocking in the work based on those photographs. And then if we have the opportunity, we bring the model back right in the tail end to refine the details, which is in, in the large scale work, which I'm pointing to, you can't see, but I can see it. Um, it's uh, all of those little bits that you really can't see with the photography. And it, given, given my preference, it would be delightful to have a model here posing the entire time. I think that would uh, speed the process and it, it, would, it, would, it would be wonderful, but that's not always an option. And if you're doing even slightly dynamic work, it's very challenging for a model to be in those poses for extended periods. So there's a fair bit of Frankensteining things together. Uh, so you'll work on the foot, the leg, and the rest of the body is not in position. And then you'll shift around as you go up and work through the form. And I do the same thing with the paintings, where if at all possible, bring them back for the tail end and the last pass with the skin tones because the photography all of that is lost yeah do you and christine both do you both kind of share that same process or do you have differing ways of approaching your subjects um, i do um more what i call method sculpting <laughs> so i'll actually put myself in a pose and see what it makes me feel if it's you know something oh, wow be more tortured and I feel kind of tortured I'm like yep I got it and I oftentimes will ask the model to try to sit in this particular pose um, because um, you know oftentimes somebody else will have the body type or the look or the flexibility that I don't have you know yeah, the, nuance, the nuances that they would have yeah but oftentimes I already have a pretty clear idea of where I want to go um, having learned from Colin, I do sometimes actually just say, okay, so here's the situation and the circumstance. How do you feel? And how do you move? And just let them kind of go with that. And then there's this beautiful interaction and interplay where the model's voice actually gets to come through in the final work. And, and that's a very exciting way to yep. You ever start a piece with say, let's just bring a model in. I don't know what I want to do yet. And just have them make poses and say, I love that. Okay, let's go back. And then you'll work that way. Or do you like, have an idea or a gesture or a sketch 
or is Actually, it the one of our favorite model exercises is you get them to crumple up in a rock shape on the floor and pretend they're a tree. So they're growing up into this tree. Oh, wow. And they go through the most interesting poses because yeah, that's, that's a great they're idea. doing this very dancey, um, nature-based thing and um, we like to to do things like that that are very theatrical where you might pretend like you're a fawn wandering through the woods and looking at the the butterflies and the rivers and um, we do a lot you know we, we we take a lot of pictures in the first couple of sessions and we throw most of them if not all of them away mm -hmm. but usually there's like four that you're like yeah that's a cool direction and then we'll bring them back in and say yeah we really like what's happening here can you play with that and colin is is actually much more expressive with that kind of interaction with the model than i am uh, where he can really coax somebody to keep going in this particular direction that he's finding intriguing i think we're often trying to find the the movement between poses so rather than yeah, what yeah. you think of as a traditional artist pose where they strike a pose, uh, it's getting the dynamic, the movement, the dance, and finding something that is the unusual part in between what they may think of as a pose. And that's what really drives the art. Yeah, that, that's, I like that, yeah. yeah. I have a quick question for, for Randy. I was looking at your um, sculpture of the rooster or the chicken. Uh -huh. Right. Um, do you, this is a sound weird, but do you use models for that? Because other than the face, the detailing on the feathers is really extraordinary. Do you use reference for those? Um, you know, so like the the vulture and the anglerfish that we were looking at earlier um, are you know a little bit more imaginative, but that that rooster really had a quality of um, like you looked at a rooster. Do you have roosters, or do you look at something, or are you just making Thank that? You. Uh, we have chickens. We don't have any roosters. Uh, you're not allowed to here in town. Roosters are outlawed or whatever. But um, anyways, uh, I use somewhat, some of my chickens, kind of like the, the whatever you call it, a little crop or yeah. whatever you call it, I think. I just to kind of like the texture and stuff. Um, but it's, it's pretty much just all uh, photographic reverence. I just do a lot of Google searches for images and stuff. So. Okay. And then a, a buddy of mine actually helped, uh, who said he was raised with those kind of chickens, the, I don't know what they're called, the, I'm blanking out on them there, the band, but the really colorful ones, they're like almost like rainbow colored and they've got like the big tails or whatever. But it was like one little tweak that he did, he's also the one that helped me tweak the wings on this guy um, wow. years ago, but he's just like this bird expert animal expert i mean he just he's been doing it for forever and anyways the the one thing he did with the rooster tail he just said he just put it in almost in layman's terms which really nine times out of ten just kind of it's like a light bulb going off but he just told me how those back feathers flowed and it was like that's all i needed to finish that piece and hmm. he just kind of explained it how it's like a weird triangle folded feather and it's just these multiple feathers that's what i was struggling with was how to make that tail look like they do mm -hmm. and he just gave me one one idea for one of the feathers and that's it just like it completed it same thing with this guy when he just went through the anatomy of how the feathers you know your your the anatomy your hands and then your the, the long feathers are their fingers or whatever but he just said, do you mind if I just do a couple chops? He had like two chops and it would just make <laughs> the piece. So I was just like, damn. Yeah, but yeah, yeah a lot of, it's, it's pretty much just all, a lot of photographs. I try to get it to a realistic point, but then I take and exaggerate it so it's more, you know, cartoony, I guess. All my stuff's just pretty That's much cartoony. amazing that you can create that kind of 3D from, just from 2D reference because it was so well stuff. Uh-oh. Hey. It's time. 3D oh. talk, quick questions. Oh, this is painful. <laughs> so, um, there you go. Uh, you all know how to play rock, paper, scissors, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to paper, scissors, and whoever wins gets to pick who goes first. And you can pick yourself if you want to go first. 
So you have to hold your hands somewhere where we can see them so nobody's cheating. Okay, and we're gonna go, ready? One, two, three. Uh, paper cuts scissors, right? Or scissor cuts paper. Yeah, so, so you get to pick who's What is that? Paper. Yeah, what is that? Is that two pieces of paper? <laughs> two pieces of paper. <laughs> My scissors can go through two pieces of paper. <laughs> I think the scissors went through four pieces of paper. <laughs> Your scissors are who dull. Would like, who would you like to go first, Mark? Uh, Colin. Colin. Fair enough. Uh, if that's going to be the case, uh, Randy, pick me a color. Yellow. Yellow? Done. Interesting. Nobody's picked yellow so far. Well, Randy's that kind of guy. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> He'll always go outside the box. Have you ever splurged on an expensive tool you really wanted, and was it worth it? All the time, and absolutely. From the things like, uh, I remember one particular brush that was a watercolor brush, and I, oh, I dreamed about that brush for a long time. When I finally got it and pushed out the boat, every time I picked it up, it was a joy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's worth it. Absolutely. Uh, at age 12, what did you want to do with your life? I wanted to be an artist. At age five, I wanted to be an artist. At age three, I wanted to be an artist. Still want to be an artist. Yeah. No try. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like surprises? Sure. Do you do any forms of art other than sculpture? We are uh, painting and um, and writing. Who is one of your favorite sculptors of all time? Bernini. What's a piece of advice you have for sculptors? Stick with your voice. Have faith in it. What's your biggest fear? Oh boy. <laughs> Being asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I actually know what his biggest fear is, so if you can answer it, I can tell you. <laughs> a little person. So I, so I can do a phone a friend? Yeah, you can Go do for a it. phone a friend. <laughs> um, so Colin's biggest Why, fear, Mark? Colin Poole's biggest fear is that he will die at the end of his life without having created everything that he's dreamed of creating. Oh. Is that right? That is correct. That's legitimate. I like that. And, and that is actually probably why there was a long pause because it is something that is uh, uh, so close to my heart that it's, wow. it's hard to articulate it and it has me mute. Do you have a tattoo? Nope. If you got one, what would it be and where would you put it? I'll take a pass on that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'll maybe just tribal all of my face. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to let you do that. The Mike Tyson thing. Yeah. Have you ever apprenticed with someone? And how was yes. it? Okay. I did three apprenticeships and I found them invaluable. Very different artists doing very different work. And what I learned from them uh, has lasted my life. And one of them was a bronze sculptor. One of them was a metal sculptor, and the other one was a serigrapher. Hmm. Nice. If you could spend a day with anyone from history, who would it be? Can I go back to Bernini? Yeah, <laughs> say Bernini all day long. <laughs> Horror or romance? Romance. Good for me. <laughs> uh, what are three words that describe you? Can I do the phone a friend again? I think you'd have to phone it. Randy, you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with stubborn, tenacious, and you can pick the last one. We we'll might pick up romantic. Gorgeous. <laughs> what did you say? Gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's not it. And it may be better if I lean further back. Uh, <laughs> uh, what do you feel passionately about? Art. Bravo. 
Okay, Helen, you get to pick who goes second. Oh, I got to do everyone? I thought it was just... Oh, Randy, bring it on. So... Randy, you get to pick a color. Purple. Purple? <laughs> Purple. 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 So the same questions? No, because they're all different. They're all different questions, and right. honestly, I'm I have to some passes. Quite a few passes. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call, call Mary nearby so she can do the phone phone a friend thing. Mary, what do I think? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me my opinion. We're gonna have to add that option in, right? That's my real name, believe it or not. <laughs> but it's a great but name is, for is it true that his hand of the king is the full part oh i like that yeah i actually keep getting mixed up with randy newman <laughs> with you two <laughs> <laughs> i keep wanting to start singing these really weird songs okay so are you ready what is your favorite thing to sculpt fish fish if they made a movie about your life who would you like to play you Pass. <laughs> Brad Pitt, come on. Yeah, okay, sure. I'll go with Sean Connery. <laughs> sure. Good one, too. If you could have dinner with any sculptor, living or dead, who would it be? If I could what? Have dinner with any sculptor, living or dead, who would it be? Uh, I would still have dinner with a guy named Herb Minery. He's been one of my favorite sculptors of all time. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He lives in Loveland, not too far from the foundry. Um, he's just one of the coolest guys you'll ever meet, and he's incredibly talented. And he's kind of who I've always strived to be like, because whenever you see him, he's that same cool, nice person. So, yeah. Nice. Herb Minery. Favorite color? Purple. Go figure, right? What is the worst material you've ever sculpted with? Castelline. <laughs> right. That's fabulous. Is that what you use, Colin? I'm sorry. If no, I... no, I've never, I've, I, I have some and I have never, I've managed to do anything with it. I hate it. It's like sculpting with gum. Uh, were you named after anyone? Mm, I don't think so, no. Is there an artwork you saw that changed your approach to your own work? The rabbit on Twilight Zone, the movie. <laughs> that makes sense. Yep. <laughs> My favorite sculpture of all time, almost. I think it goes that. <laughs> yes. It's the creepy little rabbit that comes out of the hat in the Twilight Zone, the movie. Right. Oh, awesome. Yeah. What do you listen to while you're working? My wife's radio show. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Draw every day. What's one of the most adventurous things you've done in your life? Jumped off a 30 foot cliff into a small little river area, maybe. Wow. <laughs> There's only five feet of water, I think it was, so. Stupid more than anything. No, I think that's the stupidest thing. Yeah, stupidest thing. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> <it's not> <laughs> Do you daydream? Do I daydream? Yeah, too much. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Mm, invisibility. Invisibility. I mean, the one you would want, or the one you think you would be best at. <laughs> Uh, when, when, same answer. <laughs> when do you laugh the most? When? With my wife. With your wife? With nice. my wife. Okay. Bravo. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I have to go now. I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> okay. Go downstairs, Mark. Go downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> Good questions. Which color do you want? Um, black. Like your soul. <laughs> that went through my head right when you said that. <laughs> what
what's your favorite material to sculpt with? Uh, Oil-based clay. Have you ever made a sculpture that you really didn't want to part with? And did you? Yeah, but I made a bunch of them. So I parted with it, the eel walker, because that was, that's still my favorite of mine. But I don't even have one yet still. So, because I couldn't afford to keep everyone. So eel walker. <laughs> what are you currently reading? I don't read a lot. I listen to audio books. Um, well, something you've always wanted to learn? To play the violin. Interesting. Oh, that would be so awesome. What's something unusual about you? Unusual. Oh, shoot. This is a typical pass, but I'm going to try to do it. Um, Not answering questions really fast. I don't know. I unusual. I like. Um, I'm more into. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Susan. You're I, I kind of. I'm thinking of movie themes. I like. I'm more into uh, now. I'm the older I get. I'm more into like the period piece movies. That's not unusual. I think that's. Not about you because you're opponing a friend now is your extraordinary imagination <laughs> okay done yeah. okay. they never pick up <laughs> <laughs> who is a living sculptor who has inspired you um i like to say for only one reason is is his his amazing work is richard mcdonald that's all i'll say right now <laughs> What is one thing you still have from your childhood? I actually have the first sculpture I ever did. And it was a little ceramic flat, you know, rolled ceramic with a little scribed in like cat eyes and whiskers and, a, and feet. And it's like that big, what you did in like second grade. But it's all broken and I glued it together, so. <laughs> when are you most creative? Mostly in the morning, like right off the bat, I'll, before I even feed the dogs and get up, I, I just want to jump up and do something, so morning. What's one of your favorite sculptures of all time? I think it's the Bernini one where, what's it, the, uh, the one with the hands, the, the rape of, yeah, yeah. the one at the Borghese. <laughs> yeah, that's like all of us, right? I know, I know, too obvious. <laughs> Actually, I just love it so much. Uh, what's something you wish someone had told you when you first started sculpting? Um, hmm. Don't uh, move past your frustrations, I think. Pepperoni or Hawaiian? Pepperoni. I don't like pineapple on a pizza. <laughs> when you get off track in your work, what brings you back on track? Um... I think inspiration from other artists, going online and just searching out cool art and it just, it starts to burn, starts to fan the flames for me. Inspiration from others. And what is your biggest dream with your work? Biggest dream? Mm -hmm. To do a life-size monumental piece somewhere, I mean, I've done, smaller stuff but to do actually something like that into a prominent place and I don't work hard at all at that so I wanted to just come to me <laughs> so bravo you all did great <laughs> before we before we wrap it up um because many people don't actually read the article I hope they do because there's gonna be really great pictures in there but um can you just tell me where would be the best place if somebody wanted to see more of your work what's the best place for where's the best place for somebody to find it and mark why don't you go first um i don't have my own proper website so i would i would say my instagram it's at mark newman sculpture okay. so i post most of my art there okay and colin colinpool.com c-o-l-i-n-p-o-o-l-e.com and randy I have a couple. I've got a, my website is randyhan.net. 
and my Instagram page is at Randy the Hand. Believe it or not, Randy Hand was taken. And otherwise, I post on my Facebook page, Randy Hand. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for coming out and doing a little shop talk with us. And um, it was really fun. I learned a lot from you guys. I wish we had a bit more time, but um, we're going to have to wrap it up. And for everybody who tunes in, uh, till next time, keep creating. Bye. Thanks. A lot of fun, you guys. It was awesome. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.